Hello, now we are in Budapest. I'm worried more than ever. We have been planning this interview since summer. I was offered to fly to Medellin, Colombia. However, it's expensive, time-consuming and dangerous. So, we decided to meet on the natural territory in Budapest. Nobody knew about the guest except my sister, mother and groom. Today, Sebastian Marakin, known as Juan Pablo Escobar, is the guest on my channel. The son of Colombian drug lord and uh, narco-terrorist Pablo Escobar Gaviria. He is one of the most famous, cruel and rich criminals in history. The son was the last person who was heard his voice before the arrest. That call was the reason how police discovered the location of the drug lord. We will find out how does his family live after his death and what does a child feel who knows from the childhood that his father is a bandit. So now we are in uh, Budapest. Why did you choose Budapest for a presentation of your new book and what is it about? Well, my new book is it's about my uh, my father's enemies because you can find a lot of books about my father but they are all written thanks to you know our family members or some relatives or even some partners that work with him so uh, but you cannot find the voice of his enemies and i thought that we need to know and to have the whole perspective the whole story in front of us and so i approached to my father's enemies and i asked them to if they were willing to tell me their stories uh, with him perhaps some stories that i never knew and that he never told me and actually i risk my life to write this book and uh, and i'm here because well thanks to the publishing company they invited me to present uh, my book to the public to the press sadly thing uh, sadly to the due to the covid uh, 19 situation we cannot do any book signings and something like that because that's the thing i prefer to be in touch with the readers but um, the purpose of this book is trying to discover the new stories about my father that the stories that he never told me and i believed it was very important for for me and for the story that his enemies could say something about him and and i promised them that i will respect every single word they say even before publishing the book i sent all the manuscripts to them and so they would approve that if their version of my father's story is correct or not and they all approved so it's also a book about the reconciliation process with them as enemies so i think it's a book is not only that doesn't only touch the surface of my father's stories go deep inside so we can learn from it and do something better and and not repeat the story in uh, 2017 you said that you should never go back to colombia because it's not safe for your life what has changed over these uh, four years well you know i felt that i cannot live in my country uh, i don't know if i should feel safe or not over there my father left a lot of victims, uh, sadly, thanks to his violence. So I think I should take care of myself and my family. And and of course, I go now, I go often to Colombia to visit my family, but I don't go to public places, no restaurants. So I stay in a low profile uh, kind of life, but I don't live there. I just go there from time to time to say hello to my family or also to perhaps be part of a documentary or some kind of uh, project that has to be with my father's life. But I don't think it's, I, th I believe it's, it changed a lot uh, so far for better, for good, but not enough to start thinking about the possibility of, of coming back. And I also have a son, an eight-year-old son, and I would like him to have the opportunity to be educated outside of the country and perhaps, you know, have so many, many other friends all over the world. And then we will see. Who is Pablo Escobar? Well, depends who you ask, 
But for me, it is my father, uh, the first uh, thought. But of course, he was also a killer. He was also a drug dealer. He was also a terrorist, a kidnapper, and a man who showed us how can um, a human being be so extreme in terms of violence and also in terms of love and also in terms of helping others or destroying others. So he, he showed us, I believe, the path we shouldn't take as human beings. That's uh, how I see his, his life. Uh, I have many memories about him. Um, he was a very kind man with, him, with me. And also there's a paradox because my father was like teaching me and giving me good human values. He was the kind of man who said to me, you have to say, to say thank you, you have to say good morning, good night, you have to be very gentle and polite, blah, blah, blah. But at the, on the other side, he, was, you know, he, he sent a lot of people to kill. So it's, uh, there's a contradiction in his message, of course. So he was giving me the right examples inside our family and home, but outside there was another reality. So I needed to balance those things and, you know, try to understand if it's possible or not uh, his way of thinking and, and behaving towards the society and his family. There's also a big contradiction because at the same time I'm, I'm saying to you that my father loved me very much, but at the same time he took many decisions in life that truly affect that my, my own and his wife's too and my little sister. So there's always a contradiction in my father's life. If you start thinking about it, he was the kind of guy who supported uh, in somehow the lefty groups, but at the same time, he sponsored the right-wing groups to kill the lefties. So it was like a changing all the time. Did you spend a lot of time with your father? Well, I spent a lot of time, let's say, from the first years of, of my life until I was seven. And then, um, then when he got into politics, he was, it was for me his biggest mistake in life, trying to be part of the truly organized crime, the politics. So um, he didn't handle that well. I think it's not compatible, his activities as a drug dealer with politics but they are all mixed together even today. And in those times that truly really affected me because his decisions in life, it's, uh, when he get into the politics, uh, he felt humiliated when all the press and the Minister of Justice was accusing him of being a drug dealer. And this is where he reacted very violently and he started uh, sending someone to kill the Minister of Justice and that, that really like divided my, my childhood in two parts. So I have memories about this part, this first part, and then the second part is, it was a very violent time for Colombia, for our family. We needed to get out of, of the country, escape from the violence. We went to Panama, to Nicaragua, to many other places to try to find some peace, but it was impossible. My father was always like producing more and more violence. What lessons did you learn from your father? Well, many lessons, you know, I, I believe every page of my books uh, has some lessons to, that could be shared with the readers and the people. And I think we can learn a lot of lessons from him, but the good, the good ones, you know, because it depends if somebody can see my father's life as a success case. And I truly believe it's not a success because what is success in life? For me, at least, it's something that you can truly enjoy during time. But my father, he never enjoyed what he had. He was the owner of a lot of things, but he couldn't do anything with that. And he also had a lot of money and at the same time we were hiding and we were, all, we were almost starving, uh, no food, no water, but lots of millions of dollars. So there was like, a, what's the point of having that amount of money if you are not allowed, not even to buy a bottle of water and a piece of bread. So it's like, a, 
I cannot imagine a worse way to feel even poorer but being full of money. Yeah, at the same time, I was looking at him and, you know, I read the Forbes magazine, one of the richest men in the world, blah, blah, blah. But every weekend I was going to see him, he was like, uh, you know, living like the poorest man. No air condition, no, no luxuries, even no floor, you know, it was just dirt all over the place, n not even food. So, yeah, he could be very rich, but not, he wasn't enjoying that at all. I didn't saw him uh, happy just because he was living that kind of life. And this is sad because uh, if we can tell this story, the proper story, we will encourage the, the youth not to follow him. But the way they are presenting him through the Narco series, the Patron del Mal, and many other movies, the kids, they believe that my father's story is such an interesting guy and that they are willing to imitate him in many, many ways. And this is a big mistake because I, you know, I, um, in the social media, I receive thousands of messages and I can tell you that half of them, they said, I, I just saw Narcos and I want to be like your father. Hmm. And they sent me tattoos about my father. There was this guy, he even tattooed my father's face here. It's like, a, it was too much. It's like, and they are so proud of that. And, and it is very difficult to, make them change the, the way they see my father. Uh, believe me, if I, have, if I thought that my father's life was uh, some good example to follow, I would be the first one to do it. But it's not. Did you watch Narcos TV show? Yes, I watched it, of course, because I wouldn't dare to say anything against that TV series if I didn't watch all the whole TV series. Actually, when I was writing my second book, um, I called my editor and I, I told him that perhaps we should include a chapter about the narco series and all the movies and everything they did about my father in life. So, you know, um, and he said to me, no, this not, is this not important. And I didn't pay attention to him. So I just wrote an article um, about the second season because... I already watched the first season and, and I found lots of mistakes. And during the second season, I just, you know, with my phone, I was just taking notes. Okay, this is a mistake, another mistake. So I found like 28 of them. And I wrote a list about the mistakes I found. Even the, you know, the readers, they started helping me. Hey, there's another one that we found, blah, blah, blah. And, and this was, you know, uh, I, I published the article, I remember, it was a Friday, but uh, the, the next Monday, more than 3 million people already read the article and it was all over the newspapers, even in, I found, you know, some articles in India. <laughs> and I was like, well, what's going on? It's like too far away. And I just wrote a, a very simple article, I just found some mistakes. But the intention behind finding those mistakes was exactly to show to the, to the viewers that they are not seeing the truth about my father. And, of course, they are, Netflix is selling to them, like, this is the true story about Pablo Escobar. But they write, you know, in a very small text, they said anything, any similarity with reality is just a coincidence. You know, it's a very good way to watch their hands and responsibility towards the message they are given to society. So, uh, of course, we included the, the chapter in my book because I wanted, and I didn't, uh, I spoke specifically about the series, but also about some other movies about my father, like there's another movie about uh, my father and Benicio del Toro is one of the guys who participate in the, in the movie, but you know, so... They should give back the money to the people who pay a ticket to <laughs> to see that because you know it's like they even say that Medellin has uh, nearby the sea and we are so far away the sea so they they mix the story they 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 confuse everything and and this is not a way I am not against you know telling my father's stories at all and I'm not against that anyone can do it you know but at least do it properly you know. 
do your homework and uh, read a little bit and learn about the story and send the right message. And you don't need to add uh, special effects to this story. It has enough. And it wasn't fiction. You need explosions? You have thousands of explosions. Killings? Thousands. Kidnappings? Exactly the same. So corruption? <laughs> more than thousands. So uh, we had more than enough to tell a good story. But the intention behind is very important. And, and I believe we all who work in the media know that if you tell the stories in the worst way possible, you will have a lot of people, you know, attached to the screen and, and the rating will raise and the product you make will be even more successful. This is why in comparison to, you know, the TV series, they are speaking to millions and I'm speaking to thousands with my books. So there's a big difference. And I'm like, um, there are a lot of, you know, far away uh, ahead of me uh, telling the wrong stories to society. Uh, so perhaps someday I will have the opportunity to tell the right story so we can correct this situation because it is harming a lot of people and uh, and the producers you know the 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 the, the people who work there they I'm not aware of the damage they are causing in society you know I work as a speaker in Latin America and many other countries and you you would be so surprised how many kids in the world are willing to be like my father and my work, and, and I've been hired for, for that kind of work, is to, to say to them, it's not the way out, man. It's just, and I told them, look, if you have enough talent to be a drug dealer, I have good news for you. Half of your talent, you can be a very successful man in life, in a, in a legal business. Why, why would you need to destroy your own life and freedom and your relatives' uh, love and freedom also, just because of your own ambition? If you have talent enough to do that, we, with only half of the talent, you could be also very successful. And, and it's, it's working, but again, you know, I talk to thousands, they talk to millions. That's the difference. Do you agree that authors of movies or um, TV show demonstrate your father like a cool man, but not like a dangerous criminal? That's the worst part, you know, because... It's like uh, when you can see my how is he portrayed it in the, in the media, in uh, in the movies, TV series. He seems like a rock star. Yes. Not like a bad man who's who make a lot of harm to society. And uh, and even though I love my father very much, that doesn't make me blind towards the crimes he committed. And I'm totally aware of that. And this is. Exactly one of the reasons why I started asking for forgiveness to his victims because I am not proud of his violence and I believe that uh, another reason why I wrote my books is to allow the victims to have access to the truth because there's, you cannot repair anyone if you don't tell him the truth or her or the families who suffer. So... One of uh, my first intentions behind all my books and every documentary, even every interview, every everything that I say or participate is to build even more consciousness about what my father did in the past. And so we will raise awareness and make people think twice before believing that this is their way to succeed in life. Did the screenwriters consult you when filming the episodes about your father? No, they didn't. Uh, even I, when I found out that Netflix was about to produce Narcos series, six months before, I approached to them and I offered to them full access to my father's archives. I have more than 30,000 photos about my father during his political activities, parties, family gatherings, many other events, also handwritten letters, home movies, lots of documentation. And I offer all of them so they can tell the right story. And they said to me, no, we, we already know everything about you and your life, so we don't need you. 
And that was the end of the conversation. I am not, I don't receive any dollar from their production. Uh, it's just their call and they are allowed to do that. And um, even worse than that, I've been banned, you know, and prohibited uh, thanks to Instagram. They erased my account because they don't like, perhaps that's how I, how I see it, to have the son of Pablo Escobar sending good message to society. They only want Netflix to glorify my father. So they verified Narcos account and they allowed Netflix to publish pictures of my father and that according to their politics should be the same from, for everyone. And Netflix is not doing anything illegal with that. But I have, you know, screenshots that I, I received from my own account and they were saying, you are sponsoring illegal organization every time you publish pictures about your father. That's why Instagram delayed your account yeah. and your mother account. Yeah, yeah, that's why. And I'm happy about it. You know why? Because prohibition works a lot. Uh, it, in, it will make me even more expensive and it will make um, people more curious about me because they could find in me. So they are, you know, with prohibition, the only result they will make me and my father and my mother even twice as famous. So the effect will be always the opposite. I wish that somebody could even prohibit my books because I know it will sell triple the, time, the amount of books and, and for a higher prices. That's how it works prohibition. It doesn't matter the product. If it is prohibited, a lot of curious people will come and will start to buy. So it's good propaganda for me. So thanks to Instagram. <laughs> uh, Instagram will not block me after interview. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh. If you publish, <laughs> if you publish uh, pictures of my father, I, I, I will uh, um, publish Just, picture with you. Yeah, but perhaps they will do the same. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Just in case, have uh, another account ready, <laughs> mm. and let your followers know before you publish it. Hey, if in case I'm I disappear from Instagram, I don't know. You should have a web page or something else, as mm. I do. That's the only thing they cannot erase a web page, a personal mm -hmm. one. And so I'm I'm so happy that I'm I don't have any more Instagram. You know, I, I feel even more free as a man because uh, I I thought that we could use the social media for better purposes. And if you, you, you know, even just trying to follow their own rules, I erased a hundred percent of my father's pictures in my account. And I have this, not only the screenshot, I recorded the, in video, the process of erasing every single one of them. And it's amazing. The next day they, they appear again in my account. And the next day, of course, they were accusing me, hey, you're published uh, something about your father. And I was saying, come on, I just erased everything. I didn't, I am... I want to follow your rules, but it is like, a, and I'm totally used to that. I know there is a law for everyone, and there is a very special law for the Escobar family, and it doesn't, uh, it's not like the other ones. It's just a very specific, something that can truly harm us. But I don't take that personally. It's just, uh, I believe they are helping me, even if they are trying to attack me. I try to see the positive thing of, of, of everything that happens to me. Did your father tell you about what drugs are? Yes, when I was eight years old, my father called me. I was, I remember I was in the Hacienda Napoles and he told me, hey son, come on, we, we're gonna talk about drugs today. So he sat me down and he put in front of me in a small table, all the drugs available we had in that moment. I remember there was like 10 different kind of drugs like marijuana, cocaine, LSD, and heroin, and some others, crack. And um, he started describing me each and every single one of them. Even he confessed that he tried all of them, not heroin because of the high addictive power he has. But he was also you know, talking to me in a very, let's say, educational way, with a lot of love and not being angry at all, just 
explaining to me the consequences of abusing of every single substance and even describing me the effects that every single substance caused to the body and to the mind. And he even said to me that he already tried all of them, but also he said, I only try marijuana in a very regular way, let's say. But he said to me um, uh, a sentence that I will never forget. He said that a brave man is the one who doesn't do drugs. It's like a, he's, he told me, you are going to be surrounded by friends and many of them will offer you drugs. And I want you to know before they offer you that, what's, what's, what is what they are offering to you. And you have to say no. And if you feel someday so curious that it doesn't matter how, what I tell you, you still want to try it, call me and we will do it together. So what happened in my mind as a child, my father legalized drugs for me, so there was no more negative propaganda against drugs. If I wanted to try them, I just needed to call my father, and that was it. No problem, no prejudice, no big trouble. I didn't even felt that I was broken the law in any way, So, but that's how curiosity disappears. So I waited until he passed away, and only 12 years after he passed away, I tried marijuana for the first time in my life. Never tried cocaine in my life. Even so far, I'm 44 years old. And I don't know if I, I'm proud of that or not, but I, what I learned from that is that education is the best weapon we can use to face this problem we have. Not weapons, not a war against drugs. That doesn't work. That is only to sponsor criminals, to improve their fortunes and their power of destruction and corruption. So I see that education has been like, I don't know if the word could be proper, it's like misvalued, it's like nobody cares about education and we should start caring about education because if our kids are well educated, if we as fathers could be well educated, we don't will feel tempted to, to try drugs in the future because I think there are other things we can do uh, without, uh, you know, trying to uh, get ourselves outside of reality. Uh, I believe that drugs are not good, but they are even worse because they are, they are prohibited. They are damaging more people. You can find even uh, glass powder inside cocaine because nobody controls the substance. Imagine you are sniffing a glass powder. Mm -hmm. That won't get out of your body never in your life. And it will harm you, you know, until the last day. So drugs are not good, but at worst, thanks to prohibition. In your childhood, did your father tell you which kind of business he was doing? Well, not specifically the kind of business, but... Once he get out of politics because of the accusations and he's, he sent somebody to kill the Minister of Justice in the year 1994, 1984, we escaped and we went to Panama. And I was like seven, eight years old. And he told me that he wanted to have a conversation with me. And he told me, look, son, I am a bandit and this is what I do for a living. Of course, when you are seven year old, you could understand perfectly the meaning of the word bandit. But in a seven-year-old kid's brain, it, that doesn't make like so much sense. It just perhaps you imagine that your father is, I don't know, robbing banks or doing some like <laughs> some kind of uh, normal stuff for thieves or something like that. But I wasn't aware that my father was, in, in fact, uh, the leader of the perhaps the biggest criminal organizations of the last century. So uh, I didn't realize how huge was his organization and his power at that time. And uh, But of course, after that moment, my father started 
I started to confess me every almost every crime. We went, we watched the news, we read the newspapers together, and he said, "Yes, I am responsible for this. This I didn't do that." And so he was like telling me the reality behind the news all the time. So I was totally aware of the crimes he committed. I even have handwritten letters from him telling me and explaining me how he did this and that to negotiate with the government, to, to push the government, to, to force the government to took some decisions with violence, with bombs, with kidnappings, with everything. So I have all that information. And I already published all uh, most of the letters in my books because some people even say, ah, you don't know nothing, you were just a kid. Mm. Yeah, I was a kid, but my father was next to me and he was saying to me, yes, I killed this guy and I, I, did, I did not kill this one. And yes, this cocaine is, was mine or not. So I knew. I cannot say I didn't knew. But my father was telling me what he was doing. And what your mother uh, told you about your father? Well, you know what I learned from my mother... The, one of the first and the most beautiful things that I learned from her was uh, forgiveness and uh, and also respect for my father um, as a person because I, 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 I knew that she was always asking him to stop, to not make any harm to anyone and uh, because she was so aware that we were always uh, in a very big danger all the time and all our family members need to run away all the time because my father my father's enemy on they understood that his weak point were his family so they didn't even bother to attack my father they wanted to hurt the family and this is also why i'm so aware of uh, the consequences of the violence and my mother um, you know i respect her very much because the kind of relationship she had with my father, she didn't fell in love uh, with Paulo Escobar, the, 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 the mobster, the, the gangster. No, they, they were two very, very poor, you know, young kids in a neighborhood that nobody knew, no, not even in the map was the, the, the town. And they fell in love and they married and they had no future at all. And suddenly, you know, my father became Pablo Escobar. So I don't question her about the relationship she had with my father because I know it was uh, she was loyal and also the, the relationship was for real. She didn't, didn't fall in love with a guy who was a millionaire. That's a very different story. So uh, my mother always had like, good intentions toward my father's and her comments was, was always good. But at the same time, she was also very critical with him in front of me. So I learned that, you know, love, respect, but, you know, you don't have to swallow everything and, and you have to say what you feel. And this is how I, I, I saw her and how I learned how to speak to my father and to say, hey, don't put any more bombs, don't, don't kidnap any more people, just find a, a different solution. Do you still have to pay for your father's sins? That's a question I, I ask every day of my life. I ask that the same question to me. And I don't know if I should, but I what I feel and that what comes from society, but mostly not from society, let's say from some guys who work for the justice system, there are some that truly believe that I should. You know, it's like, uh, according to the law, the fathers are the ones responsible for the kids' sins or, or crimes. You know, what happened with the recent shooting in the U.S., they are accusing the fathers of giving a gun to the son and not the opposite. You know, it's like, uh, but in my case, I, I I read several accusations against me because, and the 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 the, um, the the reasons they 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 explain and they even write it down. It says because your father, blah blah blah. And, hey, my father passed away like more than twenty five years ago. What does my father has to do with you know my activities as an architect, writer, 
speaker or industrial designer or um, uh, producer I has nothing to do with that. But they accuse me of being my father, my the son of my father. So what well, I cannot change that. You know, if, if that is considered a crime, so I will be a criminal for the rest of my life because I cannot change that. I don't have a USB sign. When I asked them why, they said, because you are the son of blah, blah, blah. So, yes, I believe that I should not be blamed or responsible for my father's actions. But in fact, I am facing that in a daily basis. Your father teach you not to use uh, telephone. Yes, for the past 10 years of his life, before he passed away, he always told me, um, every guy I wanted to kill and I couldn't find them, I used uh, the phone to find these kind of uh, enemies because everybody calls uh, the ones they love. The mother, the father, the sister, the brother, the girlfriend, they start calling and they start making mistakes. So he, the, the first advice he gave me so we can hide properly from our enemies, he said, if any new home you have, don't install a telephone line because telephone is death. That's exactly what he said to me for more than 10 years of my life. So suddenly my father, December 2nd of 1993, he started making calls, he forgot. Come on, I cannot believe that he was considered the Da Vinci of crime. How could a, you know, such a big mind for, uh, as a criminal could ever forget that his golden rule was not using the phone, but suddenly, that day, he started to forget everything he teach to his son for the past 10 years of his life. And this is how I realized that my father was committing suicide because he understood that um, the only way out for his own family to survive was uh, having him dead. So he chose to die December 2nd of 1993. And there are a lot of information and details that can confirm that. And if you Google my father's images when he passed away and he was like in, in a roof, mm -hmm. Pay attention to one detail. It was 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and he was the most wanted man in the world, and he wasn't wearing any shoes. My father's shoes were very important, I know, because I was with him there for many years. And he even told me one day, shoes are more important than guns, because you need your shoes to run away from your enemies. Then you have the guns to shoot them back, but shoes are the most important thing you have. He even used to tie his shoes to his gun machine every night, every night. So they would all have to be together, guns and shoes together. And if you look at the, those pictures, there are no shoes. Mm -hmm. And why is that? 3 p.m., he already took a shower, he was dressed, because he wasn't willing to escape. He was waiting for them and... If you're gone, if you are going to die, and you know it, that day, will you put on your shoes? Who knows? If you are not willing to escape, you don't put your shoes. On. So, official version is uh, that government and police catch uh, your father, and your ver version is that it was suicide. Yes, and 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 it's uh, there even between the police. There's a big contradiction because. We even share the same publishing house. And this is funny because the same publishing house in Colombia has three different books. Mine and my mother's, they said he committed suicide. And there are two other policemen. The first guy who said, I was the guy who shot Pablo Escobar. And, and even the title of the book is like something like, this is how I killed Pablo. And uh, he was a coroner. And then there's a, there is a general who wrote another book. And, and in the book of the general, he says to the colonel, you didn't kill Pablo Escobar, you were in another place. So not even between friends and policemen, they, they, at least if they are about to lie, they should think it better to lie in a proper way. So people could believe what they are saying. 
and you can find another book from my father's enemy and they will tell you, yeah, we killed Pablo Escobar. And they, they even dare to give details about how they killed him and which guns uh, they use to kill Pablo Escobar. And that's, that, that's great for the story because that confirms that they are lying because uh, I don't know if you have the opportunity to see a body after it was shot with a R-15 rifle. But if, if a gun uh, like that uh, shoots somebody's head, half of the head will disappear. It, it is like that. It is, they are so powerful that they can just smash your head and disappear. It. And my father was complete, you know, he didn't, you, you, you can see the images, how he is. And so he had a nine millimeter a bullet in his head, not an R-15 rifle gunshot at all. And they all say, we use an R-15. Go to any autopsy, look for uh, bodies that were shoot and confirm with that kind of gun, and you will see how destroyed the body ends. So they they don't even think before lying. You know, they, they are very not well organized to do that. And I will tell you another thing. I don't care how my father died. I really don't. For me, it's not important. And it's not that I am attached to a position that I, you know, I, I want to say to the world that my father committed suicide because, no, I don't care. If my father, you know, he was walking and a piano fell or a truck hit him and killed him, I don't care. My father is dead. That's the only fact. But I know that for the police, it is important. So they say, we killed Pablo Escobar like a victory for them. And it's, in, instead, it is a defeat because he always promised that he was going to kill himself. And, and he always teach me even how to commit properly suicide. He explained to me why do I, I shouldn't put the bullet in my front or in my mouth or here, and I should put it in the right ear. So they, they, don't, they don't think when they're about to lie. And I don't care about their version of the truth because it's not the truth. It is what happened. And I also um, investigate deeper. I checked with the doctors who made the autopsy and they confirmed that he committed suicide, but they, they were forced to change the report because they received threats from the police. And also I spoke with the helicopter pilot who was flying exactly that day in top of the roof. And, and he heard me saying in the radio when I published my first book and I was describing exactly how I believed my father died because my father only received three shots, one in the knee, one in the shoulder, and the, and the last one he put it himself in, in, his, in his head. So that, that was exactly what happened. And, when, and I have a meeting, a personal meeting with the pilot and he said, you are right, I saw uh, what he was going on, and I saw your father kill him himself. Even more than that, uh, the doctors who made the autopsy, hey, they sent us a picture about my little sister. They found in my father's left hand. So it was the last thing he saw, my little sister's pictures before he put a bullet in his right ear. I have no doubts about that, and I know they know that's the fact, that's the truth that happens. And, and as I told you, I don't care how my father died, but I know it's important for them to say, we killed Pablo Escobar. It's like a message towards, I don't know, because the real thing behind the war on drugs is that no matter how many drug dealers you kill, for everyone you kill, you have, you're gonna have two drug dealers the next day. It's like a coronavirus, the drug dealers. They, get bigger every day. What was the last word of uh, your father? Well, we were talking about um, uh, some questions that we received from some journalists uh, from a very well-known magazine. And I was trying to say to my father, don't call anymore. I know all the answers. I can write it down. And I, because I know you, I, you know, we have many conversations. I know how he was thinking and how, how he could answer any of them because I wanted to protect him, because he taught me how not to use the phone to survive. 
and he starts. He suddenly start calling. I was so worried when I first uh, hear his voice, and I, hey, we are good. Don't call anymore. And I hang up the phone. I didn't want it, him to stay in, on the line. And um, but he he kept calling and calling. And this is why I published in the documentary scenes of my father the tapes, the recordings, because you will see a guy calling many times, and so he couldn't forget what he teach to his own sons for, ma for many years, and suddenly he started making that mistake. No, he made that mistake on purpose, for sure. He allowed his enemies to find him, and he was just there, sitting and waiting, and wait, wearing no shoes, just guns, for his, for his final battle. After the death of your father, your family moved to Argentina, where you used to live under uh, fake names. Mm -hmm. Then one day uh, the police show up with cameras and you were broke charges. The trial went on the seven years and you were in prison uh, for 15 months. Then the charges were dropped. The whole world has learned the location of your family. Do you remember what you felt at that moment? Yes, it was a very sad moment for us because uh, they started uh, accusations against us. And it was very weird. And it only happens in Argentina because we were robbed and we were being extorted by an, an accountant. So we went to the police and to the judge and we told them the truth. We explained to them uh, that we legally changed our names, we, we, sent, we, we shared with them all the documentation because it was very easy for us to get fake pay, passport, passports, but we didn't want that, so we did it in a legal way. And we explained to them that this guy was trying to steal our money and they put us in jail. It's like you are walking in the street, somebody approached to you and stole your purse, mm. you go to the police and they detain you because you were so stupid that you allowed the, the thieves to get your, your own stuff. That's exactly what happened. So it took us seven years of our lives seeing you know, and reading headlines of the local press saying they are guilty, we got them, they are guilty, blah, 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 blah. And seven, year, seven years after, the Supreme Court hired 12 accountants, 12, not one, 12 accountants to check every single coin we have, every single dollar. And all the 12, not even one of them was against that. They said, this family never laundry a single US dollar or a single peso or nothing. They were just trying to be as transparent as possible. But there was some judge, very corrupt judge, uh, Gabriel Cavallo, who was trying to make us look as guilty as possible because I don't know why, but he was like very happy. He was a most uh, totally unknown judge but suddenly he has this case in his hands. So he was so happy uh, attending CNN. So he felt so important. So he needed a case. And uh, seven years after, when we were declared innocent by the Supreme Court, there was no headline. Nobody said that we were released from the charges. And my mother was the one who stayed in prison for 18 months. I, I only stayed in prison for 45 days. But who's going to give us back that amount of time? Because we were truly behaving as good citizens. And, um, and I will never dare to be like my father or to imitate him. And, you know, um, it, is, it is sad that something like that could happen because I was, I was even now a teacher at the university when they put me in handcuffs and they were accusing me of committing crimes while I was just studying, uh, improving myself, you know, making a lot of efforts. I was the best student of the year in my university. So I wasn't a criminal. I didn't choose to be a criminal. And I know how to be a criminal. I learned from the best, I can say. 
And this is exactly why I'm not a criminal, because I know the consequences. And because some of the people who administrate justice, they are almost criminals. They believe that we should be all criminals like them. So they cannot believe that we, the family of Mr. Pablo Escobar, having all the power and the contacts in the world to do a lot of harm and to make a lot of money, we say no to that. They can't believe that. They just say, no, you're lying. So they're just constantly accusing us of no, nothing. And uh, what was more difficult for you, to hide your real story or to open your truth? I think both. Both are very hard to, to achieve because it's not easy to disappear when your father is so famous and your face is everywhere in the news. It's very difficult. Uh, in those times, there were the 90s, and uh, so there was no internet at the time, no um, smartphones. So people was, you know, in contact with some kind of reality through the media, through the press, some TV shows and newspapers. But everybody loved These, these the stories about Pablo Escobar, about the family, how we were trying to uh, to get any permission to live uh, outside the uh, the country, how we try to ask for every country's help, even you know, the, the United Nations, the Red Cross, the Vatican. Also, we ask for help, and nobody nobody helped us. So we needed to change legally our names, and this is what we did, and. It took a lot of efforts from our side to maintain the secrecy of not allowing anyone to, to see what we were really uh, as a family, the Pablo Escobar family and not the Marroquin Santos family mm -hmm. that nobody knew. So at the beginning it was a tremendous experience, very great being nobody, you know, having no last name, no importance, it was just another guy in the line, and that's it. Uh, so it was, I enjoyed that very much because it was one of my first time that I truly felt free as a man because my life wasn't attached to my last name and to my father's stories. So I don't, I don't know how we handled to live in that situation during five years in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. And we study, we rented an apartment, we live a very normal life, we didn't own a car, we take buses. I, I, I took a bus for the first time in my life in Argentina because I was born, you know, surrounded by cars and luxury everywhere. So we experienced many, many beautiful things that life has that because we were, you know, the sons of a very wealthy man, we couldn't even experience that before. So it was very hard uh, to see now that our names were all over the world and all over the press. You know, it's like uh, we were just trying to hide and there suddenly the next day, every single media in the world were saying, Pablo's Escobar family were found in Argentina and they are accused of money laundering. And I was studying, I was a teacher, I was something totally different from the headlines. This is why I don't believe in the newspapers, in the journalists at all. Because only when you read the worst lies you could ever imagine about yourself in the newspapers, um, big brands, big names, uh, it's, it's exactly that moment when you understand how media manipulates the truth and the facts. So I, I don't believe in media at all, because they lie so much about my father, about my mother, about myself, that I don't consider them serious at all. They are very, very disrespectful with the truth. And they, they said they are the most respectful ones towards that, but that's a big lie. What did you do for a living after his death? Well, I started studying, of course, when, we, when he passed away, We entered in a, some kind of negotiation with my father's enemies. We gave everything to them. 
uh, all the all the assets we had. So we asked for the help of my mother's family, and they started uh, sending us money to pay the rent, to pay for my studies. So I I became an industrial designer. I was uh, I got the highest degree in my career, and also I started also as a teacher because I was very passionate about industrial design. Of course, the teachers, they all noticed that and they all wanted me to be part of even for their own studios or even for school to to help them teach the other kids uh, how to be good industrial designers. And so thanks to that, that started to bring me lots of jobs opportunity and also uh, now it's easy. Now even I see my son drawing in 3D like mm, like so easy in his tablet. Uh, but it took me many years for me to learn that because there was a different kind of uh, operated system, DOS, and I was I became an expert in drawing 3D. Mm -hmm. So nobody, there was not much experts in, in those times. So that was a great opportunity for me because I could provide to my family. You know, I was just uh, working for architects and doing renderings about their projects and stuff like that. So I became a good expert in that. And I even became a teacher in the university teaching 3D design. So that gave me the opportunity to start over, to start from scratch. I even paid my rent because one of my teachers, they, he offered me jo a job and I said, yes, I would like to work with you, but I don't have a place to live and I'm looking for, and he said, I have a house. I, I let you live there and you pay me with your work and I paid you a salary. So I took half of my salary to pay for the, the bills and the other half I was paying the rent. And we enjoyed that very much. You know, I felt richer than in the 80s because I was free for the first time in my life. Perhaps I didn't have the money to go to a fancy restaurant or spend, you know, in stupidities like I did in the past. But I was feeling a better man already. What about your sister, Manuela? What kind of lifestyle does she have? Well, my sister Manuela, she lives also with us in Argentina. We've been there together since my father's passed away. And then um, she studied a career, she organized events, and she lived a very different kind of life. She has a very low profile. Uh, she doesn't like to appear in, in front of the press or she doesn't like to be popular at all. And, and, I, and we respect that very much. Uh, she suffered the same violence I suffered, but she was even younger than me, seven years younger. So uh, we respect her intention to stay. I don't know if it, in the shadows is the right word for that, but she doesn't want to be part of the, not the story, but he just she, she just doesn't want to be public and we respect that. Um, but you know the press they never stop, so they sent paparazzis to her house, blah blah blah. So she was worried, she didn't like that and she asked me to help her. And what we did was we created several fake accounts around the world and start a fake discussion about, how the daughter of Pablo Escobar looks. Mm -hmm. Now nobody knows because there are like five different photos about different women and none of them are like her. So everybody has a different photo about my little sister and nobody knows how she looks today. And the truth that uh, it was tragedy for her when she found out at the age of 16 that your father was a criminal. Manuela suffered from depression and tried to commute suicide? Well, I even also tried to commute uh, suicide, but um, I think that she already knew who my father was even before, even younger. Uh, so um, I, I don't think that's accurate to say that she was uh, even about to commit suicide. She was sad, of course. It was her dad who passed away, but not to that limit that he was about. she was about to to commit suicide, uh, but of course she was depressed as you know any human being should feel depressed if 
the father passed away, and even more like uh, in such a way, like in a very violent way. What about your mother? How often uh, do you see your mom and uh, where she lives? Well, we all live in Buenos Aires, uh, different apartments, different places. But my mother, she, she's a very good friend of mine. We are we stay in touch uh, in, a, in a daily basis and we support each other very, very much. And I believe that I learned so many things from her and also she her work as a mother was taking care of us, you know, saving our lives in every single day. Because my father's actions and activities put our lives in danger in many ways too. So she was there to protect us, to take care of us, to run away with us all the time. And so his, uh, her, her um, career, let's say, as a mother uh, was so important for us. We felt so uh, so much love from her and uh, and good very good advices uh, coming from a mother she was also very open-minded and and she was all, always trying to use the money we had to learn something not to spend and she wasn't the kind of lady okay let's go to the shopping mall no, she was looking for um, somebody who could teach us something about art, culture, and protocol, and how to eat, how to eat properly uh, with five forks or whatever. But she was like always trying to uh, improve ourselves with the money we had and not go buy a, a Ferrari or something like that. It wasn't the kind of lady who were thinking like that. He, she was very passionate about art also. She had the, um, the biggest Latin American art collection uh, of the whole continent. And, um, and she became an investor in, in terms of art. And she, she's an expert about that today. So I think she was a very brave woman to survive under the circumstances. And I know that a lot of people question her because why didn't you divorce uh, Pablo Escobar? Hmm. Imagine somebody saying no to my father. What uh, uh, do you tell your son about his grandfather? Well, I, I already told him mostly everything, but not with the details about his violence. If you could have the opportunity to speak with him and you can ask him, hey, tell me about your grandfather, he will start telling you, Okay, my father, my grandfather was a criminal. This is how he starts the conversation. So he already know perfectly that his grandfather was a criminal, but he also has uh, a good feeling towards him because I teach him that you should love your grandfather. It, not because he was a criminal, he is not deserve to receive love from his grandchildren. So, um, because what kind of father would I be if I teach my son to hate mm -hmm. his grandfather? So for me, my big challenge as a, as a father is to raise him with the best human values possible and the best stories and experiences about my father. So once he had the opportunity to choose what he want to do in life, he won't dare to be like his grandfather. That's my biggest challenge and responsibility as a father. Uh, imagine me if I allowed my son to watch Narcos. The next day he will be a criminal. But he's going to write uh, and he's going to, uh, sorry, he's going to read my books uh, because there, I can only think, I cannot think a better source for him to learn uh, from his grandfather's stories, so he will not dare to repeat them. Do you keep in touch with your uncle, Roberto Escobar Gaviria? No, I, I'm, I'm not um, having any relationship with him because he betrayed my father. He has no respect, no loyalty, no gratitude, no human values. He only cares about money. Uh, he's paying a lot of people to say lies about me and 
he was my father's biggest enemy. Really? Sure. Yeah. And I had a conversation with my father about him, and he told me, please take care of your little sister, uh, because Roberto could kidnap her if if I die. And I say, come on, it's, it's my uncle. That's it's not possible. He's your brother. How could he do so, such a thing? And he said, just take care of your little sister. Roberto could kidnap her. So, um, and I realized that, you know, Roberto is the only, uh, and, and his family, my father's family, are the only ones allowed to be in the country. Why is that? Because they, they all betrayed my father, even my grandmother. So the kind lady you could see on the narco series, I wish that I could have such mm -hmm. a kind lady, but I didn't, you know, sadly. And I don't feel proud to speak so bad against my own family. I wish that I could tell you, no, we were very close. He helped us a lot. He was very loyal, kind, and we protect each other and blah, blah, blah. I wish, because I don't like to speak bad, again, bad things about uh, my own family. I don't feel proud about saying this, but uh, what can we do? It's the, it's the truth. It's what I know. It's what I... And... Um, I, I, when I published my first book, and in my first book I said this because he was even collaborating with the DEA, and I said this publicly for the first time in my life, he called my lawyer and he started threatening my lawyer that he was going to sue me, blah, blah, blah. And my lawyer answered, yes, Mr. Roberto, you can sue your own nephew, but just think about one thing. What if your nephew could demonstrate that he's telling the truth and you sue him? I'm still waiting for that. So um, this guy has no respect for his brother, no respect for what a family means. And, um, and he's, uh, he has been involved in many, many other activities that you know, is make him not a serious guy at all. You know what he says? That he owns the cure for AIDS. Come on. He was building bicycles and suddenly he became a scientist Come mm -hmm. on. He's, because he's playing with people's pain if i said to you that i have the cure for aids and you have a family member who is suffering from this disease you will give me everything you have just to find a cure for your loved ones mm -hmm. imagine how evil could you be if you are playing with that the leader of the largest uh, drug cartel in Colombia, nicknamed Otoniel, was arrested in October uh, in this year. His arrest was compared with your father's one. Will there be a day when Colombia will stop being associated with the drug business? I wish, but I cannot see that kind of future for my country. We're still the first and the largest producers of drugs in the whole world. There's no other country in the world that produces more illegal drugs than Colombia. So uh, even from, um, if you compare Colombia, the 1980s Colombia from today's Colombia, how it is today, and you compare the amount of land that has been used to grow coca and many other drugs, um, during my father's time, they were like, uh, you know, you can, if you compare the numbers, you will see that the numbers are like, are like this, only four times the amount of land that my father uses to produce drugs, hmm. now it is available in Colombia. So that doesn't show that the war on drugs is working well. Even already the United Nations said it was a, the biggest failure. So what I believe is that we are, and Colombia in a way is changing that. And I believe that we were going to still be attached to uh, the, the title of being drug producers in the world. But this could change for a better purpose because le let's say the example of marijuana. Uh, Juan Manuel Galán is a senator and he's the son of the guy who my father killed, you mm -hmm. know, the, the presidential candidate. And he could be a man, Juan Manuel, the son, 
who could support prohibition more than anyone because he has more excuses than anyone to support prohibition because his father was killed because of the drug dealers and the prohibition. But even though he said, we need to legalize, we need to regularize the substances because this is the only way we can take the power out of the hands of the criminals. Just by decree, this power is going to the hands of the criminals. So this is thanks to that prohibition decree, they could create uh, parallel institutions. Now they are big, the biggest corporations you could ever imagine. And they learn a lot from my father because they knew that violence is not good for the business. Why would you want to kill all the policemen? It's cheaper to buy all of them than to kill them. Mm -hmm. And it will have less consequences to your business. So they are being very clever. And now they are part of the society that you cannot distinguish between a good guy and a bad guy. They are wearing the same suit. You cannot see. So, and, and even the good guy could look even worse than the bad guy because they know how to look well. And, uh, and so now they are mixing society. Now we don't know who they are. And um, so the, the business, the prohibition, what is only happening is, is making and helping uh, the drug dealers grow more and more and more every day. So I should say that um, every politician that support prohibition is not doing a different thing than helping the narcos to be even worse as, as, as criminals. So I cannot understand. I see that politicians are not stupid. They could see clearly that they are supporting the narcos if they um, advocate in favor of prohibition. Uh, I don't know any, uh, any drug dealers who supports legalization. They're not stupid. It will be the end of the business. So Mr. Juan Manuel Galán, the senator, he introduced a law in Colombia that allows, you know, the legalization of the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no more deaths about cannabis. Be be cannabis doesn't kill, but the drug trafficking and the prohibition together kills a lot of people, brings a lot of war and fight between gangs. And now I am the owner of this corner. No, I am. And they start killing each other. This is how it works. So this is bringing peace and even prosperity to the country because now for the first time in our lives, we are exporting legally airplanes. They fly to Canada and they are buying the marijuana flowers and nobody dies, you know, and nobody's shooting in the streets and nobody's being bribed because now it's legal. And you know what? Uh, the state, the government, they, are, they have and they are receiving more economical resources to finance education, to finance uh, and raise awareness to the kids and to bring culture, arts, education and many other good activities, sports. So the, the kids won't feel tempted about that. And now that it's legalized, Nobody's more curious uh, about that because no, you can just go to a pharmacy or you just can buy it and that's it. And you can find a lot of products, uh, pharmacy products uh, in, in drugstores that really help in, to improve uh, the people's health. Epilepsy, glaucoma, Parkinson, many, many diseases can be treated. And we are just starting to learn because with prohibition, they compare marijuana to heroin, like a very hard drug. Mm -hmm. You cannot compare one drug to another. And now Juan Manuel Galán is also starting to publish a law that will include cocaine as a, uh, for medical purposes. So we can change. I don't know if we are going to change um, how we are seeing um, from different perspectives as a country that produces a lot of drugs. But I know that we are producing some changes inside our law that are going to allow our country to live peacefully because this is the only way legalization 
to take the power and the money away from the criminal organizations. If you want to support the criminals, keep prohibiting. That's the perfect way to support them and to allow them to challenge and to face any government. Today's drug dealers, they own submarines. Come on, they have a lot of power and just because of prohibition. I am looking for a judge who could prohibit my books so I could sell my books triple the price. Mm -hmm. Because that's what makes prohibition. It only raises the prices of something that could be very cheap. In your opinion, which country nowadays are the center of narco business? Well, I should say that the drug dealers also found a market inside their own poor countries like Colombia. In the 80s, all the amount of drugs that were produced, they were exported to the United States or Europe, and we, we, we didn't have many addicts in our countries. We just sent all the drugs to the rest of the world, but mm -hmm. not for us. But now, the drug dealers, they discover they have a, their own markets inside their own countries, and very big markets. Let's say Mexico City, 25 million people, only one city, imagine one cartel in that city. You have 25 yes. million customers in one city. So they found out a big market inside their own countries. And now uh, I cannot, we cannot speak about the richest countries and the poorest and how they consume, if they have more resources to buy more drugs or not. Look, Africa, there are new drugs. I don't know the name, I don't remember now the name of the new drug that is available in Africa. But I don't know if you have seen, but people are walking like zombies, literally, in the streets. I, I will remember the name and I will let you know after so you can look around and see what's, what's going on. And even though we can find drugs in, in, in every place, you know, the World Health Organization says that every single year, 4 million people died because of drugs abuse. 3.8 million people died because of tobacco and alcohol. And, and they are only the same number. Only 200,000 people died because of the illegal drugs abuse. Mm -hmm. Does these kind of numbers are telling us that we should prohibit alcohol again? I don't think so. Who wants uh, Al Capone and Lucky Luciano shooting again in the streets? to sell alcohol, bribing the cops or killing the cops and selling alcohol that could leave you blind because it is a substance that is not controlled by the government. And this is what we are talking about. Uh, alcohol is not good also. Uh, alcohol destroys a lot of people's lives, uh, but nobody feels like uh, worried because, you know, you... you, you uh, when you're in a plane, you see the lady selling you alcohol. Yes. And nobody feels, ah, ah, no, nobody says that. You know, it's like uh, very normal. So I'm not saying that in the future, the same little car will have also cocaine and marijuana and whatever. But I'm saying it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Even coffee was forbidden and was considered a drug. And look, now we have Starbucks. And do you see the DEA outside of Starbucks, like making a... An operation outside? No. Just everybody wants coffee. Everybody likes coffee. So it is a cultural thing. And this is why I believe we need to bring education in the first place, not guns. Uh, this is a war that has been confronted in a military perspective, from, from a military perspective. And this is a health problem. It's like the scientists, the doctors should say today and should recommend that Hey, bring the biggest guns so you will fight coronavirus. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't work that way. Yes. But, you know, drug consumption and addicts, this is a disease. This is not a war against criminals. They are just consumers. And the UK is about to change that, you know, the, the, the perspective they have about the consumers and they, because we have, they are not criminals. A guy who consumes any kind of drug, he doesn't want to kill anyone. He's, he doesn't want to rob you or to make any harm to anyone. I don't know why they do that, but they do. But 
did you still have to treat them as criminals? So you will raise the statistics and you will say, no, we are good. Uh, we are going uh, to win the war on drugs. Why? Because you're putting addicts into prison? Come on, offer them a treatment, medical treatment, not prison. You offer them prison, then they will come out as criminals. Mm -hmm. That's what the drug on the war on drugs is producing to the world. We have to change that perspective and we have to declare peace on drugs. We have to give ourselves the opportunity to start sharing our lives with that problem and facing it through education. The quote of your father, we must be uh, realistic. We live in the area of cocaine. The problem of drug addiction is a lack of education and discipline, just like with alcoholism. There is no difference between a drunk person lying on the street or the person under influence of drugs. Do you agree with your father? Absolutely. Fathers? Cannot agree more. Absolutely agree with him. So, thank you for the interview and... Uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, after this information, people will not uh, think that the drug dealers are uh, rock stars. That's why I'm trying to be very careful about the message and not um, let them, them think that this is the way to succeed in their lives. Uh, this is a way to destroy yourself. This is a way to destroy your own talent, your own freedom, your own family. And nothing good remains after my father. Nothing survived. Not the properties, not the money, nothing survived. And if you look around, there's only dead people. Only dead people. Sadness, no hope, and trying to repair the chaos. He, he, he was part of it. So. And for me, the most important thing is to leave a positive message that yes, in Colombia, we live this story. Uh, yes, we have several um, TV series, movies and documentaries about Pablo Escobar, but sadly they are not telling the truth. They are encouraging others to follow him and we need to stop that. We need to raise awareness and we need to show also respect towards my father's victims. There was a lot of suffering, there was a lot of pain, and this is not a funny story that uh, we can you know, use for fun, to, for entertainment. This is a story that should be used and needs to be used in the most responsible way we could ever use it, so we will raise awareness and invite others not to repeat it. So, thank you for the interview. Thank you very much. Uh, if you like this interview, please leave your comments, uh, subscribe on channel and put some like on this video.